All right, we're going to start with prayer. And then I'm going to answer a couple of these questions because they play in very well to what we're talking about. All right? So let's pray. And then we'll start. Okay? So gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together. I ask that as we gather and talk about your word and what you're doing with the Jewish people, uh, Lord, that this would quicken in us the importance of being ready for the return of Jesus. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now I'm glad you asked that, that question, because I'm going to deal with it, and then I'm going to go right into this end times part four, where we're going to be talking about Israel, okay? First of all, you asked the question, and Jackson, you were asking that too, weren't you, that uh, is, is being Jewish a religion or a, a nationality or an ethnicity, or is it both? And actually, according to the Bible, it's both. See, a, a person who's Jewish, I, I, and I'm talking about DNA-wise, a person who is Jewish is someone who has come out of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? That's why Ishmael doesn't count. They're Muslim. Because it, they come out of Abraham but they don't come out of Isaac or Jacob. And the promise of the Messiah, the Son of God coming, is through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why the Messiah had to be Jewish. Okay? But also, they have to be a believer in the God of Israel. Now, this is where it gets confusing, because nowadays, there are a lot of Jewish people who are ethnically Jewish, but they don't believe in their own God. Okay? Like, how many of you have heard of Alan Dershowitz? Okay, he's a lawyer. He defended OJ. And he, he's on the news a lot because he's, he's a big supporter of the nation of Israel. The problem is that biblically, he would not be recognized as Jewish. And the reason for that is it's not enough to just come out of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You actually have to believe in God. And Alan Dershowitz does not believe in God. So it, 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 you have to be both at the same time. That's, that's a biblical Jew. All right? Now, uh, did you understand that? A biblical Jew is a, a, a Jew, is a, is a person who's a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they believe in God. Now, Actually, St. Paul makes that point as well as Moses. You know, you're not just a Jew because you went through some religious ritual or you come out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have to be a believer. That's what makes you a real member of Israel. Okay? <coughs> now, so, so here's... No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, the problem nowadays is that we often focus on the, the bloodline without the religion. Now, it's quite true that there are people who have bloodlines that include Jewish people. My great-grandmother, I found out when I was in Florida, my great-grandmother on uh, my mother's side was Jewish. She was of the tribe of Benjamin, and she was a believer in Jesus as her Messiah. So she was 100% biblically a Jew. Okay? But when we talk about DNA, all right, just DNA, there is DNA that's specific to Jewish people. It is specific to Jewish people. You know why? Because throughout the world, wherever the Jews have gone, they've, they've been distinct. They've had their own communities. It's not just the people that force them into them. They tend to be in their own communities, and they, there, there's been a lot of intermarriage between the tribes. So it's distinct. You can tell in someone whether they have a bloodline that includes people from Israel and those who don't. Okay? So there is a specific DNA for that ethnic group. 
So we need to be fair about that too. But biblically, biblically, uh, to be a Jew, it's not enough that you're related to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have to be a believer. God does not recognize you as part of the people of Israel if you're not a believer, even though, even though your tribe might. Okay? Does that make sense? That's why it's important that you understand it's kind of, it's both. Now, you asked about Judaism. All right, now, let me tell you, the religion of Israel, the religion of Israel is what's now called Judaism. But understand, it wasn't always called that. It was called faith in God, and it was the religion of Israel. The reason that the word Jew got placed on every member of Israel is because of the fact that Judah, one of the tribes, became the most prominent. The temple was in Judah. And when they returned from exile the first time, most of the people that returned, not all, but most of the people that returned were members of that tribe. Although there were others who came. So when, when they were talking about uh, Israel, very often they just grouped them together, not, not the Jewish people, but the nations grouped them together as Jews, members of Jude, Judah. Okay? Does that make sense? So you can be of the tribe of Benjamin and they would still call you a Jew. Except that tribally that would be incorrect. A Jew would be someone who is actually from Judah. Okay? But they all got called that. Okay, any questions about that? That's why Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. Okay? He is a He's a Jew. But he's a Jew not only because in his human nature he's from Israel, but he literally is from the tribe of Judah. Because his ancestors, humanly speaking, come from David, and David comes from Judah. All right? Now, the reason that's important, ladies and gentlemen, is because we've been talking about the end times, and what to watch for. And I left last time telling you that Israel is basically the minute hand on God's clock. When you see what's going on with Israel, it's a sign that we're getting close to the time when our Lord Jesus is going to return. Again, we don't know the day or the hour, but there are signs to look for. And the signs that we can look at have to do with with Israel. Okay? The Bible makes this plain. So the first thing that I want to do is go over some things on the board. Like I said before, Israel is the key to seeing what signs are coming. Okay? But now I want to deal with this. It's called replacement theology. This is a theological belief that came... Uh, probably in the 4th or 5th century. Anybody here hear of replacement theology? No? I'll explain it to you very quickly. In the 4th century, the um, main Christians got together. They were angry at the Jewish people for two reasons. They were angry because they were trying to evangelize the Jews and the Jews were essentially saying, don't want to be talked to. The second thing was that the Jewish people had, from time to time, persecuted Christians and helped the Romans put them to death. So with that in mind, in the 4th century, there was a council of Nicaea, which is where, by the way, we get the Nicene Creed that we, we speak on Sunday from time to time. And in that council, a lot of the Jewish, I'm sorry, a lot of the Christian leaders decided that, you know what, we're done with Israel. 
From now on, what we say is that God has taken all the promises that were for Israel and made them null and void. So from now on, it's all about the church. We get all the blessings. Israel, God is done with them. You know what that led to? It led to an awful lot of persecution of the Jews throughout Europe, throughout uh, the eastern the Eastern Mediterranean and the Western Mediterranean. Because what happened then was that they were called Christ killers, and because they rejected Christ, then they rejected God, and they were basically animals who could kill on sight. It's called anti-Semitism. And while not everybody in the church agreed with the people at Nicaea, because the Nicaean uh, majority had the blessing of the government, guess who won? Those that had the blessing of the government. So basically what happened here was that the Christian church started rejecting its Jewish roots. And that's why, for example, Easter moves around on the calendar and very seldom is actually where it should be. Wherever you see Passover on the calendar, three days later, there should be what? Easter. Because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. Okay? So, that's why it's important for us to see that we kind of lost some of our Jewish roots, and it became popular for Christians, Christian theologians, to say that, uh, you know, all that stuff about God restoring Israel to the land doesn't count anymore. It's all about restoring the church. Okay? That's why they started saying that. Let me show you why that's not Bible. It's not biblical. Don't ever believe that God is done with Israel. God has a special plan for them. And we need to pay attention to it. Okay? Let's look here at Romans 11.1. 1. Open up your Bibles to Romans 11.1, 1, please. I'm not giving you every single scripture. I'm just giving you a few to look at. 11, verse 1. Okay. Romans 11, verse 1. It's right after Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Okay? Romans chapter 11, verse 1. All right. Everybody there? Okay, Aubrey Greedle, I want you to just read 11, verse 1 for me, please. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. So look, what, what Paul is saying is that God has not rejected the Jewish people as a whole. Because every, every, every generation has had Jewish people becoming believers in the Messiah. My great-grandmother was, was one of them. Okay, Paul, all the disciples, the early disciples were Jewish. So we need to understand that even though a lot of the people of Israel rejected Jesus, that doesn't mean that God has rejected the entire people of Israel or his promises to Abraham. Okay? Don't worry about it. It's a picture that fell. Evidently, masonry doesn't like that kind of tape. Okay. Um, now, the next one is this. 11, 25 to 31. 25 to 31. Um, chapter 11, verses 25 through 31. Jackson. Chapter 11, verses 25 to 31. I want you to read that for us, please. All right, hold on. Chapter 11, 25 to 31. Okay, everybody there? Waiting for it? Let me know if you're all there. You're all there? 
All right, go ahead, Jeff. Listen, be wise in your own sight. I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is coming. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will be, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Uh, as, wait. That's perfect. That's fine right there. It's good. All right. Now look. Here's the thing. Notice again. Is God done with Israel? No. No. It's true that the majority of the people of Israel had rejected Jesus. And therefore they were under a curse. But it's a partial hardening. One day. After the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God is going to do a work in them. To bring the remnant to faith in Jesus. So he hasn't given up on them. Okay, don't ever believe that God is done with Israel. He's not. He plans on using them for end time purposes. One of those purposes is so that we as Gentiles can be saved. Okay? Now, here's something. Does that taste good? Is that licorice or is that actually a piece of your... It's the tasting. Oh, okay. I, mean, I have a teether from Adam if you want to borrow it. Uh, I'm good. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Check, check it. <laughs> I'm just picking on you. I'm sorry. Uh, Acts chapter 1, 6 and 7. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Yep. Yeah. All right, are you there? Hang yeah. because I want you to read it. Okay, Acts chapter 1, 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. All right? Now, Jesus is alive. He's raised from the dead. He's been speaking with these guys for 40 days. All right? And now they come to ask him a question. Go ahead. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you no times or seasons that the Father had fixed by his own right. Okay, so I want you to notice something. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, is now the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to who? Uh, to who? Israel. Israel, right? They had the expectation that with the coming of the Messiah, Israel would be restored as a kingdom. By the way, they're not wrong. All the prophets declare that that's going to happen. Does Jesus tell them that it's not going to happen? No. All he says is, it's not for you to know when that's going to happen. Your job is to share the gospel. So in other words, before that happens, something else has to happen first. You know what that is? The bringing in of the Gentiles. You know what a Gentile is? Us, people who aren't Jewish. Okay? Bringing us in. Okay? So, it's going to happen, it's just going to happen at God's appointed time. So again, is God done with Israel? No. No, he's not. All right. And then finally, look at Ezekiel 36, 22 and 28. Ezekiel is right after Jeremiah. And Lamentations. All right. Go towards the middle of the Bible. Towards the middle of the Bible. Oh, right after Lamentations? Yep. Okay. 36, 22 to 28. Thirty-six, and then verses twenty-two through twenty-eight. Okay. Okay. Tom, are you there? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna have Tom read it. Everybody, listen up now. Twenty-two and twenty-eight. All right. Go ahead. Therefore, say to the
the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am all in you. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Okay, thank you. Now, I want you to notice something in Ezekiel 36. What God is saying to the people of Israel is, I'm going to return you to the land, and it's not because you're nice people. You're actually sick, perverted people. All right? They, they're actually going to return to the land just as filthy as when they left. But the reason that he's bringing them back to the land is because of the fact that people have been saying, well, look, Israel's out of the land. God couldn't keep his promise to Abraham, so God really isn't God. And God's going to say, uh, yeah, no. I'm going to bring them back into the land, and it's there that I'm going to give them my spirit, change them, and make Christians of them. In the land, I'm going to do a national revival where they are going to know me. Okay? And by the way, that's what it means when it says that he's going to take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh is, is one that's responsive. Stone can't respond to anything. But if I were to, say, take a, a poker and poke you guys in the side, I bet you would respond, wouldn't you? Okay? Well, that's because your flesh can respond. So that's what a heart of flesh means. It means that God's going to be able to speak finally to these people, and they're going to hear. By the way, that's very important. Because what we need to see is that when you think about Israel today, Israel Is Israel back in the land? By the way, notice that God says, I'm going to bring you back to your land. Is their land whether they're in it or not? Is Israel back in the land? A lot of them are, aren't they? Isn't there a nation called Israel? Right? And God brought them back into the land. If you go to the nation of Israel today, you're going to find that Israel has a lot of good points, but it also has a lot of bad points. They have, they have the same filthiness going on there that we have in our country. They have witchcraft, they have the occult, they have sexual immorality, they, they have abortion on demand. Uh, they can be just as wicked as the rest of the Western world. God did not return them to the land because they were nice people. He returned them to the land be, for two reasons. One is, he's going to prove to the nations that he's God. He's going to fulfill his promise to Abraham. And two, it's in the land of Israel that God is going to bring a revival, which means he's going to wake them up to who Jesus really is. And many of them are going to get saved. What are you saying no for? Them, they're talking. <laughs> I'm kidding, they're not. <laughs> what are you saying no for? Um, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway... You understand what, what he's saying here now? God is not done with Israel, and Israel doesn't have to shape up for God to work because God's going to be faithful to his covenant. Okay? He's going to be faithful to his covenant. By the way, why is that good news for us? Well, what would it what kind of what what kind of salvation would we have? If God could say, you know what? Yeah, you know, 
I promise to forgive you through the blood of Jesus, but I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. How much forgiveness would we have? Zero. But what God is saying here is that he is faithful to his covenant even when the people he's faithful to aren't faithful to him. He's faithful. Okay? That's good news for us. Because it means that on his end of it, he's always going to be faithful. What we need to do is repent and turn to him. Okay? Got it? That's why it's good news. You don't have to worry about God changing his mind. He's not going to love you today and hate you tomorrow. Okay? He may not be happy with what you do from time to time. But the covenant still stands. All right? All right, so let's look now. And here I'm going to need uh, Jackson. Why don't you come help me just for a second? All right? All I want to do is turn it around. Because, so, which way do you want to go? You go this way? Sure. All right, I'll go this way. Thank you, sir. Got it. Perfecto. Thank you. Because it likes to break and go boom, and I don't want it to do that anymore. All right, so anyway, I want to go over a little bit of the history of Israel with you then. Okay? Because this is important. God is not done with Israel and he's going to do something in Israel that's going to bring the coming of the Messiah. Okay? First thing we need to see is the history of Israel that we need to know. They were exiled to Assyria and to Babylon between 722 and 586. In 722, remember that after Solomon died, there was a new king his son, Rehoboam. At that point, the kingdom of Israel split into the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah, which also included Simeon and parts of Benjamin. Okay? And the Assyrians came and destroyed Israel, the northern kingdom, in 722. Then in 586, the Babylonians came and destroyed Judah, and both the Israel, the, the, the people of Israel in the north and the people of Israel in the south were exiled. They were sent out among the nations, settled in other places. Okay? There was a partial return under Cyrus the Great. Let's look at Isaiah 44, 28. Isaiah 44, 28. Okay? Anybody there? Isaiah 44, verse 28. Isaiah 44, 28. Isaiah 44, verse 28. Naomi, are you there? You said 28 for the... Yeah, 44, verse 28. Okay, you there? Okay, now I need you to speak up loud. But guys, pay attention now. Okay, go ahead and read that for me. Just 28. Just 28. Okay, now look, I want you to see how accurate Scripture is and how awesome God is because God named Cyrus over a hundred years before the guy was born. And God said, this is the man who's going to send Israel back to Judah 
They're going to rebuild Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild the temple. And that's exactly what happened. Cyrus the Great defeated Babylon. And then he sent the Jewish people back to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. You can read about that in Nehemiah and Ezra. Okay? But anyway, the point here is that when God promises he's going to do it, he does it and he does it exactly the way he says. Okay? That's something that you should take to heart because when you see a promise in the Bible, that's the way it is. Take it to the bank because that's the way it's going to work out. Okay? That's how God is. He doesn't lie. And when he says the man's name is going to be Cyrus, the man's name was Cyrus. Cyrus the Greek. Now Cyrus was not a believer in God. He didn't even know he was acting on God's behalf. But God said through Isaiah, this is what he's going to do on my behalf. And he did. Now, here's the thing. It was a partial return, but not a full return. Not a full return. And many of the people of Judah and Israel lived in that land for centuries. And then they were exiled again by the Romans after 135 A.D. In 132 to 135, there was a revolt in the land of Israel. They revolted against the Romans. There was a man named Simon bar Kokhba who, who claimed he was the Messiah. And the people followed him. And then he got destroyed by the Romans. And then what the Romans did was they took all the Jews out of the land and threw them out. And exiled them. And then they, they plowed all the earth with salt so they wouldn't grow anything and tried to destroy any remnant of anything that would possibly denote that that land belonged to the Jewish people to the point where they started renaming their maps. And you know what they renamed that area? It wasn't Judea anymore. It was Palestine. You know what Palestine means? It means the land of the Philistines. In other words, the Romans were trying to change history so that Israel would never be remembered. Didn't work out real well, did it? Because God is not going to let it happen. But anyway, that's how the land got to be called Palestine. Because the Romans renamed it for the land of the Philistines. And Israel, there were people that went back to the land. So there was a Jewish contingent there for many, many centuries, not very large. And they certainly didn't control Jerusalem or the land anymore. And then, we see that we have a second return predicted. Uh, just open up to Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. Okay, Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. Okay, Aubrey, you want to read that for us, please? Okay, read it up loud so we can hear you. Okay, stop right there. He's going to extend his hand how many times? A second time. So there was the first return, which is this one, the partial one. Now, after they're out of the land again, he's going to do what? Do it again. All right, finish up. Cush. We feel like Ethiopia. From Ellen, from Shinar, from Ham, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a sig signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel. Okay. So God is going. By the way, you know what the, the word coastlands simply means? It means the whole world. 
actually, if you look at where where the Jewish people have been uh, have been scattered, every continent has a section of Judaism. They found them in China. They found them in Ethiopia. They found them in in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and other places. Obviously, we have we 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 have them in the United States, Canada, Mexico, everywhere. Okay, God has scattered them. And God is going to bring them back. Okay? That's the promise of the return. Now, I want to share this with you. That return began in 1948. In 1948, the United Nations agreed that Israel, well, actually, before 1948, they agreed that Israel should be allowed to have their own nation in what's now the land of Israel. And they, they, they partitioned the land so that Jordan would control part of it, Israel would control part of it. Israel declared their independence in 1948. Now, I want to tell you something. That's a fulfillment of Scripture because God said that the nations would work to establish Israel back in the land. And they did. He also said that that nation would, 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 would begin in one day. It did. What happened after 1948 is that immediately six Arab nations attacked Israel and tried to drive them into the sea and destroy the land. It didn't happen that way. Instead, Israel not only survived, but they beat them and took a lot of the land that was given to Jordan, except for the West Bank. And they took over that part of the land. But they still did not control Jerusalem. And then in 1967, the Arab nations attacked Israel again, trying to destroy them. And in 1967, Israel won took over the West Bank and established control for the first time in 2,000 years. Control over Jerusalem. Jerusalem was, actually it's even longer than 2,000 years. Jerusalem was finally under the control of the Jewish people. Because really, Jerusalem wasn't really under control of Jewish people since uh, the Maccabees. Um, because when Rome took control, Rome actually controlled Jerusalem, not the Jewish people. So for the first time in a couple thousand years, Israel now controlled Jerusalem. And that's the fulfillment of Scripture. Yes? Is, weren't the Maccabees the family that, or like, I don't know the whole story, but isn't that how Hanukkah became? Yes. Modern, or... Yeah, because uh, Israel, uh, after... After, um, you can see this in Daniel, God said that after, uh, after a point in time, uh, the Greeks would come and defeat the Persians and take over. And they did under Alexander the Great. And uh, the Maccabees were a priestly family that uh, after Alexander died, he divided up, his, his, his kingdom was divided up four or five ways. Okay, and uh, two of the generals took pieces of land. One was Egypt, that was the Ptolemies, and then the Seleucids controlled Syria and the Holy Land. Well, the Seleucids want, came in and forbade the Jews to sacrifice to God, and they wanted to uh, sacrifice pigs to the god Zeus in the temple. The Maccabees revolted. There is a Jewish revolution. And for a short period of time, the Jewish people were in charge of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. It didn't last real long, but it lasted for a little while. And that's where Hanukkah came in, because they cleansed the temple, and they only had enough oil for one day, but it lasted seven. And that's where you have, that's where Hanukkah came in. Okay? So anyway... Understand then that 
the return of Israel to the land and control of Jerusalem was prophesied in the Old Testament. And I want you to look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 6. Okay? It's the next to the last book in the Old Testament. It's Zechariah, Malachi, and then it goes to Matthew. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 6. 12. All right, everybody there? Nope. Got it? Okay, who hasn't read yet? Basic. You want to read? I don't know where it is. 12, 12 verse 6. Okay, will you read that uh, 12 verse 6, please? In that day, I will make the government of Judea like a fire pad in the town, and like a All right, so what that means is that there would be a war. When Israel came back into being, there would be a war. There were several of them. And Israel would defeat the surrounding nations. They did. And one of the signs that we're getting close to Israel, uh, to the coming of the Messiah, is that Jerusalem would be inhabited again and ruled by the Jews. They would finally control Jerusalem. 1967, they took control of Jerusalem. And they're still in control. All right? The, the reason I'm saying all of this is that you are living in times where you are watching biblical prophecy come to pass. Look at Israel. Look at how the nations are working with Israel. And you will see that we're getting close to the coming of the Lord. And you don't have to turn there, but in, in Ezekiel chapter 36 through 39, and also in Revelation uh, chapter 20, you will find that there is an alliance between Gog and Magog and Persia against Israel. Gog and Magog is now what you would call Russia. Persia is modern-day Iran. It says they will have a treaty. Guess what? They have a treaty now. And they'll also include Egypt, Syria, Right now, Russia is in Syria in alliance with Iran, in alliance with the governing authorities of Syria. And Egypt is an ally of who? They used to be our ally, but they're not anymore. Russia. What that means then is that things are moving exactly the way the Bible says they will. Now, that doesn't mean that tomorrow there's going to be a great war where Israel gets clobbered, because that's coming too. But, nevertheless, you can see that the nations are already being aligned for that time. That's why it's important, when, when you look and you see what's going on in the world, don't worry about what the paper says is the political point. You think about what the Bible says. Because what the Bible says is really more important, and that is that all of these things are lining up for what reason? So that the Messiah can return, Jesus. 
Okay? Now, there's some more that I want you to see. Before, before the coming of the Lord, a third temple needs to be built in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. Uh, let's look at Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Revelation is in the back of the Bible. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Okay. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Are you, are you there, Amy? Yeah. Okay. I want you to read verses 1 and 2 for me, chapter 11. Then, then I was given a measuring rod, measuring rod as a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of, of God and the altar of those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. And, and they will and they will grab the holy city for three months. Okay. Thank you. So what that's saying is that before the coming of the Lord, they're gonna build a third temple in Jerusalem. Okay? And understand this. They're getting ready to build a third temple in Jerusalem. There's actually a society there for the building of a third temple. They already have the priest. They already have, have built what needs to furnish the, uh, the, uh, the, the temple. They already have uh, the altar ready. They already are, are training priests how to slaughter the sheep. Okay? Actually, at one point, they even had uh, a ceremony like that outside the... the one of the walls of Jerusalem to show how this is done. And when President Trump said that the U.S. Embassy was going to be going to Jerusalem, okay, what happened was that the Temple uh, Society built, or I'm uh, sorry, didn't build, they had minted a coin on it a coin, and the coin had the face of Cyrus and the face of Donald Trump together. Now, you remember who Cyrus was? I just mentioned it. What did he do? Okay, the Cyrus sent the people of Judah back to Jerusalem to do what? Build the temple. Okay? And now, the Temple Society is saying that this is our go-ahead to build the Temple in Jerusalem. And that's actually gaining a lot of support, even among those who don't believe in God. But they're Jewish. And they love their Jewish identity. So, it's on the way. Okay? Also, Israel comes to salvation. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 12. Go back to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 10. Okay? Zechariah chapter 12. Start at verse 10. Okay? Start at chapter 12. And go to verse 10. All right, everybody there? You guys there? Okay. Aubrey Greedle, if you will read uh, cha uh, chapter 12, verse 10, and read verse 10 to the first verse of 13, chapter 13. Okay. okay. 
12, 10 through 13, 1. All right, okay. go ahead. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of, inhabitants of Jerusalem a, a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. Okay, and stop right there. God is speaking here. He says, they will look on me, the one that they pierced. What's that say about Jesus? Right, but who is he? Is it just man or is it God? He's God. God is saying, I'm the one you pierced. All right, go ahead. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Ramon. That's it. Hadad Ramon in, in the plain of Megiddo. 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 Yep. The land will mourn each clan by itself with their wives and themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of, the, of Shemai and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. Okay, then go 13 verse 1. On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and, and impurity. Okay, all right, sin and impurity. So understand what this says, all right? Guys, at this time, all right, when Israel is in the land and they're not pure, God is going to give them a spirit of grace and supplication. In other words, he's going to open their eyes to who Jesus is. And they're going to realize, we killed the Messiah. We rejected God's God's purpose and plan for us. And they will mourn as for an only son. In other words, that mourning is a mourning of repentance. They're sorry for what they did. And they're going to cry out to God. And then God is going to open up a fountain for the forgiveness of their sins. In other words, the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse them and they're going to become believers. Okay? That doesn't mean every single Israelite is going to believe. But there is going to be a remnant there that recognizes, oh my goodness, what did we do? This is why we've been cursed all this time. And they're going to get saved. Okay? It's a reminder, too, that it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or Gentile, you cannot be saved except through whom? Through Jesus. Salvation is only through him. Okay? So they have to get saved. By the way, this is starting to happen there too. Because uh, there is a time when if you mention the name of Jesus, they would spit. They want to hear it. And now there are many, many, many Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and, and, and in Israel. I think they, they, they represent more than 10% of the population now, which is good. Okay? Now, finally, there's a war coming, and that will, that will bring the coming of Jesus. Just look at Zechariah 14. Okay? You're in Zechariah. Go to Zechariah 14. All right, now, um, let's see, I'm going to go with Felicity. Hi, Felicity, how are you doing? Good. Awesome. Um, I want you to go to Zechariah 14, and I'm going to tell you what to read here just in a second, okay? I want you to read verses 1. One through nine. Okay. Behold, the day is coming for the Lord, when the spoils taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken to the houses, plundered, and women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the 
people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives and lies before Jer Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives. Shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other move southward. They shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azel. You shall flee as you fled from the earthquake of the cities of Uzziah. Yep, Uzziah. Uzziah, yeah. king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and the holy name ones with him. On the day there shall be no light, cold or frost. And there shall be no be a unique day, which is known as the Lord, neither day nor night, but on but at evening there will be uh, shall be light. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, as the Lord will be king all over the earth. On the day, the Lord will be one, and His name one. All right. So look, what's saying here is that the day is going to come when the nations will rise up against Israel. They will capture Jerusalem. It will be a great slaughter. And half the people will go into exile. They'll either flee or, or, be, or be taken. The other half will stay. And then the Lord will come. And he's going to come to what mount? mount? The Mount of Olives. I want you to remember something. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he ascended from the Mount of Olives. And when he ascended, the angel said to the disciples there, why do you stare in the heaven? He will return in the same way in which he left. So in other words, where is Jesus going to return? The Mount of Olives. And it's there that he will defeat the enemies of his people. And he's coming with his holy ones. Which means not only the angels, but actually that's when you're going to start getting the saints to return who are in heaven. And there's going to be the resurrection of the body. And there's also going to be the rapturing up of those who are left. Okay? So understand there's a lot to happen. But if you want to know approximately how close we are to the coming of the Lord, I would tell you this. We're close. It may yet be many, many years because a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. But let me tell you something. We've been watching a lot of things start to come together just in, in my generation. So expect to see great things in your generation as well. You know, you might be the generation that's here when the Lord returns. That'd be kind of cool. All right? All right. Let's pray, and then uh, we will uh, come back next Sunday, okay? Thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, I ask that you would bless these people here. I pray that you would protect them with your holy angels. And I pray, Lord, that you would quicken what was said here to their hearts. And that they should every day be a people ready for your return. And we ask this, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. All right. Next week, same time, same place, same station.